three forty. You want to kick start? off? Yeah, yeah, sure. So before we before we kind of figure out how our applications are doing, how are you doing? How's everyone? It's been, it's been okay. Awesome. It's been a long day, so um, you know I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're with us. We're going to talk about observability and especially you know how open source help build observable solutions. My name is Maris Bogovici. I'm leading a team of chief architects in the, uh, in the CTO office at Red Hat, focusing on technology, strat like technology strategies that work with customers and also help influence the, uh, you know, the, uh, the product strategy of Red Hat. I'm personally very invested in open source. I've been a, an open source contributor and project lead since 2008. So you know, I'm very, very excited to talk about observability today. And I'm joined by my colleague, Eric Rosenbaum. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Rosenbaum. I'm the chief technologist in what we call the Global Financial Services Practice at Red Hat. So I work with about 111 banks around the world, uh, trying to help them in their consumption of open source, improve their operations through you know, Red Hat technology as well as that of our partners and other open source uh, projects. So to get us started, so why are we here? First question, because observability is so hot right now, obviously. <laughs> Everyone talks about observability, it's interesting. So hopefully what we can do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so is break down what is observability, why do we care about observability, and how open source tooling can help you build more observable systems, and hopefully a couple of best practices that you guys can take home and adapt uh, within your organization. So why are we here? I mean, here's a picture I, I grabbed, I think it was from the Netflix blog, tech blog, showing the interconnected, interconnectedness of some of their services. So in the old days, going back, we had monoliths. So we had an entire application running on a, on a single box. You had one log. You know, it wasn't talking really out of the system. It was all self-contained. As we've moved towards more distributed systems, more microservices, breaking problems down into smaller pieces, it becomes more complex to understand what does it mean by is the system operating or not operating? Because it's not just a single piece of an application. You want to look at the whole thing end to end. If you're taking a transaction, if you're, if you're sending a payment, it may go through multiple systems to get there. It may start on a web browser. It may come to an x86 machine. It may ping pong off a mainframe. It may talk to an entitlement system. It may obviously query a database. All these pieces here result in your end to end response and your end-to-end -end experience for the customer, whether that's internal or external. So the observability is trying to understand what's happening under the covers and letting me understand. I, I sort of liken it sometimes to you know, driving a submarine. You know, there's no windows in a submarine. You, know, you need pretty good maps. You, know, you need a pretty good understanding of how fast you're going, what your, what your direction is, you know, to make sure you don't hit something. Anybody who's seen uh, Hunt for Red October, you know, some great scenes there. You know, if you have the proper processes and the proper tooling, you can do a lot you know, if you have no windows in your submarine. So that complexity, that interdependentness of applications has obviously sparked interest in the term observability. If we look in Google Trends, you know, over the last five years, it's an eight or nine percent, eight or nine times increase in the searching for observability within systems. But that gets us to observability needs to be something that's baked into a system as a first class citizen. It's not enough to go after the fact and say, OK, my system's operating. Bad things are happening. I don't understand what hap what's happening. Let's add observability. I think what Marius and I want to talk to you about here is the idea of making it a first class citizen, baking it in the, f the first place, adding the right tooling, adding the right processes to have a first class observable system. And Marius, you can take us through. Really, sure. what is observability? And you know, Eric, when, you, when I think about your analogy with the submarine, I always think about not just one submarine, but actually a fleet of submarines <laughs> that you have in your, like, that you have in, in your portfolio. So, you know, kind of in a nutshell, observability is about creating systems in which we can ask questions without having to change them all the time. Like we want to find, find out new things about how the system works. We want to go back and figure out, you know, certain errors happen, and then you want to figure out why they happen. We want to we want to start asking all these questions, you know, don't by gathering. Whatever you do, don't touch that. <laughs> various sources. <laughs> it's not very observable. <laughs> not anymore. Um, and you know, we want to answer 
you know, resolve issues by gathering data from, from, you know, from various places. And I, Eric, I think I, to... I was standing like three feet away this time. Um, I think we need to do something. But <laughs> Okay, I think we're fine. Um, so, you know, in, in a nutshell, you know, when we think about observability and kind of put up all this theory in front, the, the obvious question is, okay, fine, but we already have monitoring. Like, we already kind of have ways to look at systems and figure out what they're doing, which is not what's happening right now on the screen. You know, and we have, like, we collect metrics and... Oh, you speak. I'll jigger this I around. think we're going to share the deck with you afterwards. Uh, we can collect metrics, and they tell us if a system is behaving or misbehaving. You know, we're looking at certain thresholds and say, okay, fine. If it went, if we went past that threshold, it means that something is wrong. You know, and that's a perfect way to do things. Like that is your first line of defense. That's how you understand if something is going on in your system. It's also something that was very, very common when systems were very simple. Like if I had one machine and a program running on that machine, then probably kind of seeing if the CPU went to 100% means that something is wrong, and I can reboot that machine, and that's my solution. But you know, when things are kind of more interconnected, it's not just that. Right? I have to look into you know I, I have to look into uh, more um, you know I have to look into more into the, into the the root cause of things, which is what we're trying to figure out right now. Fingers crossed, like, this is how we pro this is basically how you program and deploy, you know, just do a thing in and cross your fingers. <laughs> um, but then, you know, what, what does observability help us do? It's kind of go beyond that alerting mode, beyond kind of looking for anomalies, beyond, beyond looking like, you know, something anomalous happened and I need to take action, and it starts kind of helping us ask questions on why did it happen, build some context of, you know, what happened at the time when this kind of, like when the CPU went 100% or latency went like that. And a good example that I just found in, in one of the blogs that I was kind of pre prepping for this talk was a payment system where they noticed, for example, that spuriously their latencies grew from milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. And in a payment system, that's a bad thing. They couldn't figure out why it happened. You look at the kind of underlying systems, nothing abnormal. Finally, by looking at who talked to whom, they needed distributed tracing. By looking at metrics, which, is, which, which showed them the latency, and looking at the logs, they basically told them what kind of requests were flowing through their system, were able to figure out that it was actually a mishandled HTTP header. Nothing to do with your database, nothing to do with anything. A very hard error to find. So, that's what observability does in, in, kind of, in its I first instance. Pause you for a second there. I think the great example, you know, you're saying this is, in my experience, you get a call from the MD, you know, and says, okay, my so-and-so was logging in, tried to do this, and it took her 20 seconds. It should take a second. Why? Yeah. And the, with proper observability, you know, okay, who was the user? And to be able to dig in and find out, okay, end-to-end, -end, this user, you know, yes, it took 20 seconds, and where within that 20 seconds was, was it? Were you hitting an entitlement system? Was there latency in the database? Because there's these sparse, you know, jitters sometimes in applications, but when you find out with proper observability, you, you can drill down to that exact transaction, and I think that's the difference between, say, monitoring or just logging versus observability. Yeah, and, and that's why essentially, like, you know, when you talk about observability, one of the first things that comes to mind is, well, we've got to correlate the metrics with the traces and the logs and kind of build a, build a picture, you know, out of it. But kind of moving forward, you know, it's also about how we think about our systems in the future, how we start asking, as I said, new questions, not about just bugs, but basically how they perform, where we need to invest, you know, where do these kind of, when, where does this behavior, you know, um, you know help us, uh, for example, generate more revenue. And that's kind of more, more interesting as we move into the future. Obviously, there are some challenges in here with observability. And one of them is, as I said earlier, you know, we kind of developed our monitoring systems and logging systems and everything in an age where machines were individual machines. They had funny names, like you know, characters from like Star Wars characters or something else. I kind of knew what, where, I, where I need to connect. Now we deal with polyglot instances running on the clouds. If you have seen a container, for example, the name of the container, that's completely incomprehensible. So how do you kind of correlate that data? How do you understand what you're doing in there? Furthermore, 
you're generating a lot of data. You know, one of our, you know, one of our, uh, uh, you know, one of the clients that we were working with, one of the issues that they had was simply we get too much data. The latency of 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 writing all that data down is is a burden. The cost of storing all that data is a burden. So. Yes, it's great that you want to build these observable systems, but you start making trade-offs, and you have to do some You have to make some intelligence decisions about how you build those systems. You know, and of course, you know there is the siloing. How do you get the different teams that work on applications kind of work together? For IT, for example, you know the state of the machines is relevant. They don't necessarily more care more about the applications themselves. For application, like for for the application teams, it's more about how the applications behave rather than the health of the systems themselves. How do you get all that data, how you correlate it, how you build that single big picture? That's one of the big challenges of observability. So we touched upon this you know, in, in, in bits and pieces, but really, what do we need? What are the foundational blocks to an observable system? There's metrics, logs, and traces, okay? Metrics are singular numbers that tell me maybe how long something took. I made a query to a database, how long did that take? How many uh, payment transactions have I done? There's logs, which I think all of us are familiar with, you know, log4j, for example, let's kick all this stuff out. And then there's traces, which is more of your end-to-end, -end. I'll talk a little bit about this in a second, correlation IDs, and how do I know that my transaction, my request to transfer $100 from myself to Marius, you know, that whole trace as it went through all those disparate systems in the middle. So to do this, I mean, there's a number of best, best practices that, in my experience. One is governance. Consistency is key. Set a standard, commit to the standard, follow the standard, okay? Nothing made it more difficult when we're trying to trace where a problem lied, when you know, one system calls a customer, one calls a cust ID, one calls it ID, one calls it CID, and you're trying to tra trace something throughout. I see a lot of nodding heads, like, yep, been there before, done that. So it doesn't matter what it's called, just please be consistent, <laughs> okay? Maybe match what's in the database, I, I, just be consistent. And the same way, you know, what are your timestamps? You know, are you using a standard, you know, year, month, date? Are you using, you know, milli since epoch? Again, doesn't matter, be consistent across the organization. And that's about governance, okay? And importantly, I would argue, let the developers decide amongst themselves what those standards are, you know? Because if he or she decides what it is as a group and then communicates that up, it'll get a better traction than if some ivory tower comes back and says, this is what we want you to do, okay? A bottom-up approach. Correlation IDs. We talk about traces. Again, my example of transferring money over to Marius, it's gonna go through a handful of systems. So you need a unique identifier that follows that whole transaction throughout all those different systems. In the past, I usually would create it on the UI, so whether it's JavaScript or, or whatever, create a unique correlation ID, it may be an account ID, it may be uh, a GUID, doesn't really matter, but then follow that through, maybe put it in headers, Maybe you put in your payload or your, of your message, whatever it is, because ultimately you're going to go into your, your Elk stack, Sumo Logic, Splunk, or whatever. You're going to search for that correlation ID, and then boom, you're going to get all the, the transactions, all the events associated with that. That's going to make your life much easier. Okay? You may have systems such as a mainframe where you're not going in and changing that code, but a, as your x86 system calls out to it, you certainly can say, I'm calling out to this with this correlation ID and this is how long it took. Because ultimately, if someone says it took 20 seconds when my SLA is one second, you want to be able to go through the trace and find out where it was slow, okay? And that's what I get to dependencies. Every time you're calling out to an external system, a dependent system, my suggestion would be tr you know, trace that and record how long it takes. The number of times people yelled at me for my system being slow, and then I'm going to an entitlement system that was down during the middle of the day a database that was overloaded. So it doesn't help with the SLAs, but allows me to then have a conversation with different teams about why things are, are happening as they are. Any dependent system that you don't control, definitely have timers on. Okay. Back to you, Marius. Sure. So, you know, that's great that 
you know, this conversation about why we want to have observability, how to build observable systems, and how we apply the best practices. What exactly are the tools that enable us? And because we're an open source in finance conference, it's important to recognize the role that open source plays in building observable systems. There is a wealth of tools you know, that are out there um, that kind of cover different parts and kind of work together to build this image of, a, you know, on a, of, an, of an observable system. You know, um, you know, even early on, one of the first uses of Kafka was to transport telemetry data from, from different systems, right? You have tools like Prometheus, for example, that's used for collecting metrics. And then you have, um, you have tools like, uh, like Thanos, for example, for, um, you know, for um, aggregating, uh, for, uh, for aggregating logs. And then you have um, tools like Vector, uh, sorry, Vector for aggregating logs. You have uh, tools like Thanos, for example, for, for storing metrics. And then you have tools like Jaeger for, for storing distributed tracing, and you have open, um, you know, open telemetry, for example, as a tool for, that helps you collect that data. There's a lot of them, and each one of them, the first question is, why do we have so many? You know, what functions do they serve? How do they work together? And I think for, for understanding that, it's good to understand kind of the, the cycle of observability. It's not just about collecting data. It's not just about, it, it's, it's covering the entire life cycle of the data from the moment when it leaves your application to the moment where it actually helps making decisions. And you have to collect it first, you know, and this is like the challenge, the typical challenges here are how do I instrument my applications easily? Maybe I have some old applications that have been out there for a while that I don't want to go and modify and rebuild them and deploy them. How do I get information out of them? Um, you know, or how do I do that in new applications? How do I instrument across an entire fleet of submarines, for example? Then comes the problem of storage. How do I store data efficiently? Like, how do I, you know, imagine that I'm collecting data from a variety of sources, there's a lot of it, how do I put it, you know, in, 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 a, in a distributed way, in a way that can be also be queried easily when I need it. And of course, there's a matter of security. Think about a log, for example, those contain a lot of information about what your, system, what your users have been doing. You don't want, like, even if it's not personal information, we know not to put passwords in logs anymore. Everybody knows, knows that. But you can still reconstruct a lot from, user, from the user's behavior and identity just by monitoring what they have been doing and how they were interacting. So that data has to be accessed in a secure manner to be compliant with, uh, you know, to be, especially in financial industries, where are so stringent privacy requirements. And of course, you have, you know, the delivery. You have to normalize that data. You have to transform it. You have to basically make sure that you kind of get that uniformity um, so that it can be analyzed. And visualized. So you have tools, for example, like, like Persis, for example, for visualization that help you understand, you know, and convert all that, you know, all that data that you've collected into an aggregated view. Um, and finally, of course, you want to make decisions. You want to analyze this. You want to make kind of more intelligent decisions based on this. You want to support them. And when you think about all these tools, you know, they figure they, they're, you know, they're distributed across this, you know, across this wheel, if you want, at different places. So for example, you know, Prometheus, Vector, and OpenTelemetry help collecting uh, metrics, you know, store, you know, things like, uh, like Thanos and so on. A good and interesting aspect of open source is that it helps you build things better. You know, it helps you kind of figure out with all these things that are around, both open source and third party and commercial offerings, how can, I make, how can we make things simpler for our users? So in that vein, you know, an emerging standard in here is open telemetry. So open telemetry has become one of the, you know, what has originated primarily as an open standard for collecting distributed traces. So, you know, there were a number of, of, of tracing mechanisms back then. You, you had Jaeger, you had Zipkin, you had a few others, and you can't have, like you can't make that types of decisions. At some point, that kind of behavior becomes a commodity. You want to have a single standard in which you collect data, and that was kind of the, the reason why, you know, the, uh, <coughs> sorry, open tracing and open census, which were two standards kind of merged in open telemetry. 
Later on, open telemetry has started to evolve into other areas such as um, collecting metrics and logging. But fun the fundamental idea is you know, covering the different areas of simplifying the way we collect, we store, and analyze that data. It starts with specification, like having a single specification on what the APIs should be, what the data should look like, what the, kind of, what the different applications should emit, you know, enables you to have that consistency that Eric was talking earlier. Uh, having an instrumentation, a set of instrumentation tools, you know, that, um, that basically you know, cover a wide variety of languages. And if you click at that link at the bottom, which I don't dare do for fear of, of basically losing the screen again, um, you will see a ton of languages like from Java, C++, Erlang, Go, like any language you can imagine has you know, a library, has an, you know, an agent, has a tool for supporting you know, producing open telemetry data. So that means then that if you're developing a system, a system has multiple components, some of it's in Java, some of it's in Python, yeah. you're going to get a standard approach. In which you, in which you do things, exactly. Across, so regardless of the development language. Exactly, and that's, that's a very, like, a con it's a, you get a consistent approach that is tailored to the nature of the language. Like, for example, if you're doing it in Java, you can do it with an agent, you can do it with a library, but you have options to instrument both new and existing applications in a consistent way across a wide variety of languages. Um, and that enables essentially centralized collection of data. Now, what open telemetry doesn't do is essentially store and process the data. Why? Because as you've seen, there are a ton of other tools that do that far better. You know? um, but what, what it enables is essentially acting as the hub you know, you can see, you know, the open telemetry collector, for example, you know, working with acting as a gateway, collecting data from, you know, from various agents, instrumented applications, you know, and then choosing different backends. And the backends are exactly the tools that we talked about. Prometheus, Jaeger, you know, other, you know, third, like commercial offerings, you know, things like Dynatrace or, or Datadog. So you can kind of like, Take that approach, you can keep your investment in the tools that you had, but easily instrument your entire application portfolio. And it's not just collecting and, uh, and basically, uh, you know, just distributing the data. As I said, you had the option of fanning out. Maybe, you know, part of my observability system is, is new and is using, some, is using uh, Jaeger to monitor the data, but I have, for example, metrics in an external Prometheus system. So having that central hub that manages this and having those applications talk to that external hub brings kind of that separation of concerns between writing well-instrumented applications and where I, where I distribute the data that they produce. And of course, we're Red Hat. So we're responsible for, we're responsible for a lot of problems that distributed systems have because, you know, We've been a pioneer of container orchestration and building containerized applications. So it becomes natural that uh, we have, uh, you know, we're, we're also thinking of, you know, how to instrument applications that run in Kubernetes. If you're in a system like Kubernetes, for example, you have, you know, you have, um, uh, you know, you can have your collector, for example, run and managed by an operator uh, to basically centralize that process and enable, uh, you know, GitOps. Uh, a GitOps process for, for data, GitOps-based process for data collection and, you know, for, for, operating, uh, for operating these systems. And of course, the telemetry model has a federated nature. So, you know, I can start thinking of how I can collect and monitor data across a multitude of systems, around, across multiple clusters. You know, I can treat my entire cluster fleet as, you know, as a unified platform as a unified portfolio of applications and centralize my, uh, you know, my, my data collection and, and analysis around that. Again, this is done primarily, like this, this originated with distributed tracing and, you know, continue its, its open telemetry evolves to extend the same support for metrics and for logs. The key part here is the open nature of it enables you to have options and start thinking, like start moving the burden from, start, it starts making it easy to instrument and collect data from your applications and moving 
the burden of the process into what do I actually use that data? How do I visualize it? You know, how do I extract meaningful information out of it? And I think, you know, when you look at observability, there's, there's great tools for visualizing that. You know, you have, like as we discussed, there's, there's tools like Persis, there's, like kind of the, there's Grafana, and other open source tools that can enable you to build visual dashboards. But having all that data enables you to do a few more things than just kind of understanding the, stat, the state of your system. It enables you to correlate that data, and this is where you know, we see things going into the future. Um, correlating that data with the KPIs of your business. Right now we have SLOs, for example, established around, we think that you know, an application has, has to have such and such latency. But why? What does that mean to the user? And most of the time it's intuitive. We kind of know that if, if a payment takes too long, then that's gonna be a problem. But what is the point beyond which it's a problem, and what is the point up to which this is tolerable? As you have bigger and bigger systems, you, you reach the point of diminishing returns. Starting making informed decisions, correlating the business data, and starting figuring out, like, we lost so and so much revenue when this happened because we get so many, many, so many users, for example, abandon, you know, either stop using payments or abandon their cards or whatever your system has been doing at the time. You know, that, that's, so that's critically I, I, important. I, I've spent a lot of years in the FX desks, you know, and if your systems are latent, you know, your prices are off. So either, you, either one or two things happen. Either you take a price that's off market and you lose money, <laughs> you know, or you reject the trade. So if you're, as part of your metrics, as part of your observability, you're not just tracking the technology things, how long, what was the latency in this call or what have you, but also what was the business side of it? Maybe what would the P&L on the trade was, if you're doing that trace? You know, maybe overall what the P&L of the desk is. And then you can start correlating, you know, as Marius is, is saying, your technical observability with your business metrics. And then you can start making all sorts of interesting decisions on how, where I want to invest start showcasing, well, if I improve the, the performance of this, I can see that you know, it's gonna improve my P&L, for example, or it's gonna you know, reduce the drop rate you know, when people are in uh, the shopping cart. And I think that's a piece where you really need to collaborate with the line of business, understand what's driving their business, what their, what their metrics are, and then incorporating that into your system. Because, I mean, as technologists, we know, you know how, how many trades we've done, how many payments we're doing, the dollar value of the payments, whatever it is, we can start putting that into our logs and our traces and so on and so forth. We can then start forecasting you know, where we should be investing and the correlation between technology metrics and business metrics. And I think, you know, I think we're close out of time. There's one, just one thing that I wanted to point out you know, from, like, to add to what Eric was saying, which is in addition to the business, and there's another set, big set of metrics that are just starting being collected and have a material impact on the businesses. Metrics around the carbon footprint of your applications. Metrics around your energy consumption of your applications. These are part of both you know, ESG reports that the organizations have to, have to issue. And again, it comes down to understanding what the impact of your decisions in, in the way you design your applications is on your business in all these areas. For example, we have a project called, like, which is far, far beyond, but happy to talk about that, called Project Kepler whose goal is to identify the energy consumption of containerized applications running, uh, running in, a, in a Kubernetes cluster. You know, that is an area that, is an area that you know, for example, is, is very, very important, especially as the kind of companies become more conscious about their impact on the, you know, on the environment and the impact that they make you know, around them. So, you know, kind of like understanding that, yes, we built a very, very performant application, but it's horrible for the environment. It is gonna make things worse for everyone. It's a big problem. So kind of building, like bringing all these other metrics that start being available, starting correlating them, correlating them with the business metrics, correlating them with the kind of performance metrics of your application, I think, start building a better, better picture you, of- You can of make a trade that says, listen, I'm gonna suffer, I'm okay, instead of being 100 milliseconds, being 120 milliseconds, yeah. But if I save 20% in my carbon footprint, that might be something that makes sense for a company. Yeah. So, I mean, th these are the kinds of things, where, you know, Marius and I, you know, as we kind of brainstorm, that's where we think the observability is going, you know, and it's important to put together a cohesive foundation 
to do this, to think co collectively with your business about what metrics you want to track so that you can start looking at these figures uh, as you collect the data. Yeah. And, so. and we, we see essentially, to, to wrap it up, we're available for questions afterwards because I think we're at the end of our time. But, uh, you know, we're, um, you know, that's where we see the, the power of open source coming together. Essentially kind of starting addressing these, these different parts individually. And we'll jump in here. So if, if you get, again, we're, we're, we're available here. Email us, whatever. We're happy to share, happy to help. I have one more ask before you go. What's your ask? Uh oh. Uh, this is where I get worried. No, we don't have to see the screen. I want to take a picture with everyone. Because <laughs> we're very, very happy, and I want to have this memory with, with everyone here. Thank you very much for attending. And Eric, okay. you're here? Yeah, get everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. All. you.